Hi, my name's Kate Stewart, and um, I've been, I'm working at the Linux Foundation, but I've actually been involved with the SPDX project since way before that. Um, and I'm one of the tech leads at the project and have been fairly actively working with the um, AI uh, bomb group that basically has been meeting every week now for a couple of, what, three years now? Three years now, yeah. And so my co-speaker today is um, Gopi, and he is a research fellow at Queen's University and has been co-leading uh, the AI working group along with Karen Bennett. She, Karen Bennett can't be here today, so I'm, I'm giving more of the overview stuff and some of the details, and then I'll be turning it over to Gopi to go into actually um, well, some of the challenges we're seeing with it and where we're going to be going in the future, okay? So with that, um, let me start off. Uh, this year we actually put out SPDX3. Uh, this is something that's been in the works now for about four or five years, actually. Um, and it was motivated to a large extent by recognizing that what we had would work for your basic SBOM, but really wasn't going to scale to deal with things um, at a system level. And so SPDX basically started looking at use, SPDX grows because of use case by use case being added to it. And um, security and safety critical applications were um, on our horizon, and so we wanted to make sure we could handle that properly. And as we started looking at the systems, it was pretty clear we had to start dealing with um, the AI ML ecosystem that was emerging, as well as data sets. Because we're going to need that for system transparency. So as we get more and more automation happening, and models and so forth being trained, we're going to need to understand, the same way we have to understand the source code for vulnerabilities, we have to understand the um, models for illusions and so forth, so you can actually understand. And we need to be very precise about how things were built and so forth. So these were some of the motivators for why we actually started evolving SPDX. And we were, you know, there was a lot of fields, a lot of properties, and so we started grouping things into profiles so that people who care about a certain topic had the things they needed to talk, work from. And so this is why we sort of moved in this direction, and this is also why you've seen our name change from software to system because a data set isn't necessarily software. And there's other things like hardware that are necessary for doing the safety analysis and so forth. So this is the start of it. Um, and there's work going on, and I'll sort of foreshadow a little bit of it towards the end. But if you actually look at the SPDX 3.0, um, there are three profiles. Actually, there's more than three profiles. We've now added an AI and a data one. And this was motivated to a large extent by some of the ethic the ethics stuff that's coming out, the desire to track that, the security for AI, as well as modeling. The AI models themselves have different types of properties and behaviors that are important to track. The reason we actually switched to data and data sets is um, you can use them for AI, but you can also use them for other things too. Um, but it's important for the training and understanding the provenance of how all the data was created and then used to train the models. Um, and so we separated them out very, with a lot of thought and discussion in the earliest days of this. Um, there's new security profiles, so we can catch the VEX information and a variety of other things now. And then, quite frankly, as things are built up, it's important to record some of that processing. So that's kind of what the new heart of the new SPDX3 is. And um, you've heard some of the, there's been some good talks um, this week already about light, which is a subset that's necessary for the minimum elements for an SBOM. But when you want to start getting beyond that, we want to be able to be rich enough so that these use cases could be captured efficiently. Um, basically, SPDX2, 2, 2, 2, 3 is more than sufficient for the minimum elements. However, there really wasn't much going forward towards AI. So, like I say, you can do minimum elements. And quite frankly, um, the 2.2, which is the ISO standard, handles that. And quite frankly, it'll still handle the um, revised extension of the minimum elements that just came out last month. Well, it was um, stamped in September, but it actually got published on the CISA site last week. And if you see here, these are the attributes now. Here's the ISO standard version and the fails to use for them. And now here's what the SPDX3 is gonna look like, okay, with the JSON YAML structure. And you'll, I'll go a little bit into what we mean by core and software. Oops, sorry, I meant faster than I meant. But we have a fairly wide reach of, of relationships, and the AI profile builds on top of these, okay? So we need to have this base ground here of 
core and software for our AI, which is just additional fields that are important for tracking what's really happening with your models. Oops, now that was interesting. So at the cart of SPDX is a core, okay? And this core lets you link from one element to another element to another element. And each of these elements could be with different profile type of information, which says these are the fields that should be filled in or could optionally be filled in, which helps the tooling to actually recognize things. And so everything has elements, and there's relationships between elements, which are also elements. And then there's artifacts here, and then there's information about the agents and so forth. So this core is pervasive throughout every profile, okay? Which means that we can link it. Um, a hardware to software. We can link data sets to models. And this is what's going to be very powerful in the years to come. And the other side of it is, because we have a formal model here, we can put this into a database. And you can start to query things in a database. So as you're working through something like a CI CD pipeline, every time something gets updated, you're not generating a huge document. You're just basically updating a database entry which will let us start to really scale this out properly for the use cases we're seeing in the future. Now, the software profile is the heart of what SPDX was, and um, there's various artifacts, and there's the same thing of packages, files, and snippets. So, group of files, single file, part of a file. This abstraction we've basically had since the early days of 2.0, and it really serves us well, because there's not a lot we can't model with this abstraction. And we can apply this into data as well, and we can apply this to potentially other scenarios. Um, we basically made a decision to align with the sys SBOM types so that we can articulate how was this produced? Was this intended to be something about design of a system? Or was it source, like, you know, the sources? Or was it from a build? And so a source SBOM, I don't know why it keeps jumping. Source SBOM to a build SBOM is quite different content. Um, and then when you've deployed it, what configurations were used for deploying it? Being able to be precise about this is going to help us with vulnerability analysis down the road, as well as, quite frankly, safety analysis and risk management. And there are other profiles that are emerging um, in 3.1, which things like operations, it'll be things like hardware, and we're actually having a functional safety profile that's being developed right now. So if people are interested in that, please come talk to me. Now, our initial AI bomb transparency survey it, it sort of, the, the decision to start an AI bomb group, um, I guess, happened a little bit by, you know, basically, Karen came to me and says, you know, she's, busy, been, she's been working with IEEE for several years now, and she's been doing the IEEE AI ethics. And she came, and she and I had worked together in the past. In fact, when I had my first job at IBM, she was my manager, okay? <laughs> and so it was sort of fun to basically reconnect with her. And she, she knew I was interested in these the metadata summaries with SPDX and so forth. She said, she came to me and said, you know, we need an AI bomb. And I went, yeah, you're right, we do. And so we started looking at this problem. And then Gopi basically came in and joined us, um, had been working on some analysis from the data set side, and brought that dimension and rigor into the whole equation. And so this is how it happened. So the first thing we started doing is, OK, well, what's out there? And so we started looking at data sheets, model cards, and fact sheets. And we started looking at what some of the stuff that IBM had done, Google had done, Microsoft had done, and started articulating this in a structured fashion so we could understand what are the common denominator and elements here. Um, and then Karen brought in some of the dimensions of, OK, well, what are the standards and the regulatory things looking for? And so we you know, looked at some of the, um, you know, the, AI, the IEEE AI work, the ISO AI work, and some of the EU AI, AI Act. And we've basically articulated from them what the fields are that they're looking for and then made sure we had ways of summarizing this information. And so we also, you know, the draft EU AI Act has a lot of information in it, and we've been doing work, and we, um, Arthit has been joining us. He's been studying this as out of Ireland, and he's a researcher in this area as well. And so he was bringing some of his knowledge in from studying the EU AI Act to this. Um, and so we're certainly looking at anything that's sort of emerging and then seeing how we can map to it. And at the end, we'll show you a link to a um, white paper that just got published um, this week about the um, AI bomb and how to do it with SPDX3. And in there, you'll see a whole bunch of tables 
that were very labor intensive to put together, to put it mildly, um, that you know, basically we analyzed for each of these areas what fields they're looking for, what's, what clauses, and then how to satisfy them with the SPDX and what we've got. So we're sort of hoping this will get us a good starting point. We're going to be continuing to evolve it though. It is a topic that we'll be moving in the future. So quickly looking at what the AI profile it has itself. It's, again, as I say, it's on top of the core software. And it has about information about the AI elements. And again, these were taken from other things so that we could figure out, okay, well, how do we track what we need from a risk management? And so things like, okay, what was the type of model? What standards is it complying with? What the domain, autonomy? And then what are the limitations on it? And one of the things that was kind of an interesting, um, how should I put it? We actually figured, well, okay, um, EU's AI Act is different, different, you know, is differing from other definitions of risk. We found one differential risk last year, and we were happy with the going with it, and all of a sudden the EU AI Act came out earlier this year with a different way of looking at the risk problem. And so there's a lot of things that are coming in that we're going to need to reconcile. So I would take 3.0 here as a good starting point for us to figure out what has to happen and be changed. But I think we've, we can do a lot right now and hopefully start getting tooling built to actually make some of this stuff real, because that's when we're going to start refining it. But I think we've got a starting point now that you can actually describe what we're going to need down the road. But you know, things like you know, information about the training, information about the application, what are our hyperparameters, you know, what metrics are there, what are the thresholds, um, potentially the safety risk assessment type. <laughs> um, is there sensitive personal information happening here? This triggers a lot of regulatory issues. And is there energy consumption going on? What the energy consumption is? These are things that people are wanting to start to track for AI. And so we've got fields that they can put the data in in a standard form and find it again, which lets us do risk and reasoning. Uh, one of the questions we asked is, why don't you just use model cards? Well, it's limited scope. And there's some oversimplifications in there. Um, you know, we basically, like I say, we studied it. And we basically compared all the fields and compared that against others and decided that, you know, that's got good, some good data, but we, can, we need more for doing the risk side of it especially some of the ethical and social implications we're missing. Now, we split data off so that we could basically look and chain the provenance of data, okay? As data's coming in, it's being aggregated, combined, manipulated, massaged, and so forth, and you wanna be able to record this because sometimes that's gonna be part of a problem down the road. If your data set is not composed in certain ways, or if you've learned you didn't do something you should have done, things like that, you, may wa you want to be able to re you know, remediate it, quite frankly, and re retrain things and, do and evolve things. So being precise about the data is going to be useful, especially, you know, consider a, a, an example, for instance, would be um, in order for us to train um, you know, self-driving cars type of deal, you want to recognize stop signs, okay? If your data sets do not have stop signs with partially occluded stop signs with branches, we can't guarantee that you know, you'll actually, if there's a branch growing in front of a stop sign, you'll actually recognize it. And so that would be an excuse that, okay, we know that this data set uh, still has, has flaws in it, or we need to augment the data set, or we need to take certain data sets from different things. And as we start to really you know, evolve this whole area, these are the sorts of considerations we're gonna need from a hazard and a safety perspective. Now, data sets have different information that they care about. What's the size? Is there noise in it? The data, you know, the data scientists, um, it's the ones we consulted for what things do they want to recommend, you know, what recognize so that we can actually get um, to some degree of confidence about it. And then we also need to understand the provenance. There's a lot of interesting challenges that Go people go into for us about, um, and this was his area, one of his areas of research actually, about problems with data sets. And so we wanted to make sure they could get updated, what the intended use is, are there biases in the data, is there pre-processing? Recording this information in a structured fashion lets us do the risk analysis that's missing right now. And you know, I like the question with model cards, why didn't you just use data sheets? Well, it doesn't have the details we need, okay? The provenance and lineage details are missing. How has it evolved? And some of this will impact the licensing down the road. And you know, are there dependencies on this data? 
Is there privacy issues? Is there bias information? We don't have structured ways of capturing that today that we can reason about in a machine readable fashion right now. Um, so this is, was our starting point. And this is our chance, you know, a chance to basically augment the SPDX with information so we could start to look at this as a system. So what does it mean uh, when we try to document an example of an AI bomb now with this pro these profiles? And I'll turn it over to Gopi. Thanks, Kate. <coughs> that was a fantastic introduction. Thank you. I don't know if I can follow that, but I'll try. <laughs> so we define, we define this specification and then we wanted to uh, you know, test it or do work out an example because we wanted to see, uh, experience the pain points for ourselves and see how viable the specification was. And uh, to do that, we chose a non-trivial uh, machine learning system. It was important for us not to choose like a real world production system, but also not do it on a toy example because we really wanted to know what, what was going on. So we chose, uh, um, we chose a handwriting recognition system that uses a recurrent neural network. Uh, and uh, it has over 1,000 stars on GitHub. And it's, it's a fairly simple machine learning application. And uh, the kind of S-bomb that we wrote was an analyzed S-bomb, which means uh, the source code and all the details are already there and we are not in contact with the authors. Like we just analyzed the source code and we extracted the details. And the other thing that we had to do was we only traced up to the first level of dependency because one, we didn't have the manpower, it was one person doing it. <laughs> and uh, tracing the whole dependency chain is a lot harder, but even this, as, I, as you would know, is quite hard. So by doing this, we noted a few pain points and uh, we also identified some of the challenges that we need to solve in order to evolve AI bombs to be able to represent the next generation AI systems. So the first pain point was, it's hard. It's incredibly hard without tooling. So it was, so for this application, which was about, let's say, 1,000 lines of code with one model and one data set and everything fairly reasonably well documented, took me 40 hours. <laughs> and, and I was just plugging away at my VS code, like just specifying the JSON. This primarily because the data set has its paper through, uh, I have to go through that to identify what is the data collection process because it's not documented anywhere. What is the sensors that's used? It's not documented anywhere. It is only available in the paper. And even after going through all of this, I still couldn't find some of the information. So we need tools. And without that, this won't scale to production systems. And the second thing is all, all the uh, metadata that is needed is not always available. So, which is what I was saying earlier, right? Like, so the data set size, or what, what sensors were used, or what is the pre-processing that they did, all of this is important for compliance purposes to see if you have any vulnerabilities. And all the other downstream use cases are of an AI bomb, but the fact that they are not present in one coherent place is really hard. It makes it really hard to do AI bombs in practice and finally, and this is, the, this is my favorite one, I don't know or I don't think most people know how to do license compliance with this stuff anymore. So the data set, as you can see in the bottom, clearly says it can be only used for non-commercial research. Whereas the AI model that was trained on this data set is licensed uh, with MIT. So can they really use the data set? I don't know. If anybody knows, please let me know. But this is a huge pain point. And moving on, we, we have seen a race in, uh, since late 2022. Uh, everybody's been talking about chat GPT, right? Like, and, uh, so I'm going to refer it to as foundation models, primarily because it's not going to be langui about language anymore, and it's not necessarily going to be large anymore, or not always large. So. This, these foundation models have given rise to a new kind of software, which has only served to complicate our problems. But let me go through the type of software. So the current AI bomb, uh, when we started doing it, we were primarily focused on neuralware, where we had deep neural networks. You give some data, you train the model, and uh, you use that model, and you try to specify that model. 
But with introduction of foundation models, we are now moving into a paradigm of prompt programming, where you're not writing source code anymore. You're saying, hey, you're a compiler now, or you're a browser now. And foundation model acts as a browser. It gives you the code. So this is a new type of software. And with the increasing ability of function calling and uh, ability to use tools and create agents, we are also moving in, we are also seeing a lot of agentware, which is uh, things like Autogen, Baby AGI, and uh, these are able to reason by, you, by accessing external tools. So I I'm not gonna touch on the mindware. I know it's, it's a little far-fetched, so let's not worry about that right now, but ev uh, so, both promptware and agentware, I'm gonna be referring to them as FMware, and everything with AI, I'll be calling them AIware. So these, why do we have to worry about this? Like, uh, it's okay, it's, uh, do we think it's so far down the line that we don't have to worry about it right now? No. Uh, Gartner, pre uh, Gartner actually predicted that AI-based software is, is at the peak of the hype cycle, and recently Goldman Sachs uh, had a report out that said that FMware uh, is about to impact the world's GDP by 7%. That's a huge number. That's more than many countries' GDP. <laughs> and to compound to this problem, found FMware has a completely different life cycle compared to traditional machine learning software. So as you can see, so, so, so the first life cycle was taken from a paper that was published in International Conference for Software Engineering in 2019. And uh, the FMware lifecycle is under submission right now. So as you can see, there are new assets like prompting uh, and grounding, grounding which is to prevent LLMs from, or foundation models from hallucinating. And then there is guardrails that you put on top of it to make sure that the model is not spewing toxic outputs. And then there are agents, which is kind of different from traditional software components or traditional machine learning compo components. And the way we test FMware and the way we de deploy FMware with massive infrastructures and all the GPUs that we need, it's, it's a whole new ball game. And the, many of these new blocks are, cannot be represented with the current AI bomb. So in order, to be, uh, in order for us to do AI bombs, well, for the current AI software and the future AI software, there are a few challenges I think we need to solve to move forward. And I'm, all, I'm not going to leave anyone high and dry. I'm also trying to give some current mitigations that we can do right now. But this, the focus of this is more of a call to action for everyone, uh, to everyone here, for the engineers, for the researchers, and anyone looking for advice, please focus on the current mitigations. So the first problem is, as I was telling you, it's very, very hard to automate generating these AI bombs, primarily because information is not documented in a systematic fashion, and it's usually available in many diverse and different sources, uh, like papers and uh, different things. So, uh, so to do AI bombs right now, I, I would recommend to create a checklist of all the places where you can look for information and have the core development team who develop the AI software sign off on the bombs that you generate. But for researchers, please enhance, come work with this. Please enhance meta, uh, metadata standards, uh, standards and specifications like AI and dataset profile to be able to capture all this information and also work on developing natural language based tools so that you can automatically extract information and while you're developing that, please also develop validation and verification techniques because we don't want more uh, incorrect data in there, right? And uh, I know it's a lot of pain to usually document things, but when you're developing an AI software, if you're able to meticulously craft these bombs or craft the AI and dataset profile, it'll help. And the next problem is, Many, many countries are being very trigger happy with the AI regulations. Like, and these AI regulations are defined in such a way that it's very hard to implement them. I've been working on AI stuff for over a decade now, and I recently read the EU AI Act, and it says sufficient transparency and appropriate human oversight. What is conditions for sufficiency? What is appropriate human oversight? I think we need a way 
to clearly trace these regulations to system level requirements. And right now, I guess, please seek legal help. Ask the lawyers. If they say good, you're probably good. But otherwise, uh, for researchers, I think it's important for us to engage with the policymakers and uh, work with them to ensure that these regulations take system requirements into consideration and develop frameworks that map these regulations to system requirements. And for engineers, I think integrating compliance tracking features and demonstrating due diligence uh, is going to be very important. And the challenge three that I want to talk about is the ambiguous data ownership. We already saw a bit of a, a small example before, but there are three key problems that usually affects, uh, three key problems around data that's really hard and challenging. So first is the data lineage issue. For instance, if you're using ImageNet, you have the ImageNet terms of use that is applying to your software. However, ImageNet is a data set that was derived from multiple different data sources, which they actually don't specify. In their paper, they just say, oh, we used uh, Search Engine 1, Search Engine 2, and few other sources. What are few other sources? They all have licenses, they all have ownership, they all have copyrights. So lineage tracking, provenance tracking is an important problem. And with the recent advent of FMware, there's a lot of synthetic data being used. And synthetic data is unique in the sense that there is a foundation model that's generating the synthetic data, which was trained on different data. And the foundation model is licensed differently. The data it was tra trained on was licensed differently. So what license or what copyright laws apply to your generated data is kind of unclear. And uh, more recently, I'm noticing lots of um, chat models are requesting user feedback. They give you two responses. They ask you, which one do you like more? And you give thumbs up or thumbs down. Who owns this thumbs up? Do you own the thumbs up? Does the platform own the thumbs up? We don't know. And we need to know all of these details. And that's important for future proofing AI bombs too. So currently, I would say, try to track lineage and provenance as best as you can and create a data set profile for each of the data source of your data set along the lineage line. And uh, for researchers, we need to be able to automate this tracking process because it's very, very painful to do this manually. And uh, we need to collaborate with policymakers to identify what is, how does synthetic data copyright works. And uh, as a call for, uh, a call to action for engineers, and I'm looking at Hugging Face, or if anyone's working in Hugging Face here, please have the provenance details and lineage details as a part of your system. And I'm just not trying to point out Hugging Face. Any data hosting platform, I think, should have a data set profile because I'm partial to SPDX. But otherwise, at least still have lineage details and provenance details in there and track all the incoming data and attribute them. And the fourth challenge that I want to talk about is we need to start documenting the process too. And I will explain this with an example. Let's say you're ordering chicken soup. And more, most times you want to see all the ingredients in there. And that's what a bomb does right now. But you also kind of want to know what kitchen prepared it, was the kitchen up to code, and uh, what kind of processes that they used. Did they have a sweaty guy doing things? I don't know. So we need to have this process documented, and it's very important. And the uh, EU AI Act kind of also emphasizes this. So we need to, right now, I would say the ways to mitigate it is law, uh, like maintain detailed logs of everything that you do, use version control systems. But we need to once again enhance these existing specifications to be able to track process. And uh, for, for engineers, I think integrate detailed process documentation and record every single development decision so that when it, time to, uh, when it comes time for compliance, it becomes easier. And finally, as I was talking about FMware, we do not currently have the capability to fully represent an FMware system due to the emerging assets like prompts, adapters, guardrails, and how to do compliance in this whole new world is kind of unclear. 
and even regulations and guidelines are not being very helpful. So I think one way to mitigate it is include the artifacts even if the specification does not allow for it, like create your own stuff and record it. And uh, hopefully, we will catch up very soon. <laughs> and we will be able, uh, and for researchers, work with us, work with the industry groups, try to understand what is going on, and try to consolidate into a single specification, and, I, uh, and identify all the assets. I know there's a lot of work going on around it, but there's no one unified work that's going on, so I think it's very important. And for engineers, I think, Developing flexible documentation tools that allows you to document everything would be key. So if you want to know more about what we have right now, how to do AI bombs, I recommend reading this paper. As Kate told, we wrote it through a lot of pain, lots of tables, lots of cross-check, <laughs> lots of cross-check six months. So please do read it. And uh, I want to give a quick shout out to all the companies that supported this effort, and uh, the different participants from many of these companies who joined our working group calls. And finally, to summarize, the lack of tools right now is seriously affecting us, to, uh, affecting our ability to create AI bombs. The metadata is not readily available, and uh, how to do license compliance is not very clear. And we also saw some challenges where we like automation challenges, how regulations should be interpreted, what, how does data ownership work, how can we do document process, and how do we do bombs for new FMware. And uh, if, uh, if any of this or all of this sounds interesting to you, please participate in the working group. We meet every Wednesday, 3 p.m. EST, and if there are people from other places or other parts of the world who, who are interested, we'll try to find new times. We are looking for contributions, and we'd really appreciate your input. Once again, thanks for listening to me. And I'm happy to take any questions now. Does anyone have any questions for us? Does this feel like some, like I say, does this resonating with what you're seeing right now, or? Do you have any other perspectives that you want to share? OK. Thank you very much for your presentation. I, I just uh, trying to formulate my question because I don't want to assume what we have in front of us is a Hail Mary, no. sort of speak. No, we don't. Like, uh, let's hope someone comes with this and save us from the catastrophe of the data. Why do I say this? Please uh, bear with me. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in the example that you provide, it took us, or it took you, uh, 40 hours to, to document a very trivial AI system. Like, a, to make it probably is less than, than 40 hours right now with the current capabilities. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I, of course, depend on who's driving, right? Uh, it, it might take you more or less. So uh, I think my, my self-questioning right now is how um, SPDX uh, tree uh, is, is going to help to guide these efforts so we don't over burn in documentation. Because right now, there's a reason we call it unstructured data, mm. right? Like, uh, and the effort is how do we structure this? Because depending on the output is how can you cut the unstructured data, right? So right. Um, what can you share with us uh, about this? So. Um, <laughs> The first thing is if it's unstructured doc data, document it as such so that people who are doing the analysis can see the risk, okay? And this gives us a language to use to start to explain the risk. Now, the best solutions heading down the road is quite frankly, as people are doing the data transforms and doing the, um, as the data scientists are working with the data, Getting tooling to export this information the same way we export things out of builds for the software, for build S bombs, we want to probably get to the stage where we can actually export the provenance chain for data set transformations and have it recorded accurately. And, but the first step is to have a language so you can talk to each other. And that's what's been missing. And so this is what this is trying to do is give us a, say, a common vocabulary so we can document properties and then start to learn what we don't know. 
Because if you don't start somewhere, you know, there's, there's, you don't know what you don't know. Absolutely. And so this is a starting point. It's, we are very actively, um, and you know, quite frankly, the field is changing so fast, as you can tell. Um, we started this off, like I say, about three years ago. We finally put it up, the first pass out at 3.0, and there's a lot of last minute changes too. Um, and these things have been evolving even since then. And so we're, we're actively working on the 3.1 version of this with just some more properties and some additional information. Um, and so, but there's different perspectives and there's different regulatory frameworks around the world that are caring about different things. And so part of the reason for the ask to come help us is so you can bring perspectives in that we're not seeing. And such that whatever vocabulary and language we emerge with from these models will help solve your problem as well. And then hopefully more tooling will be able to be able to shared between the things. So, you know, I'm talking with other Linux Foundation projects um, that are involved with working with data and, you know, doing outreach there too to see if we can get some of their tooling to start talking this language for us. And I, I just want to add something to that. You asked me if we'd burn ourselves with all this documentation effort too, right? I mean, right now, like, uh, based on, on the answer, like, uh, it's a little bit more clear that being the step, the initial steps, we have a challenge ahead. Uh, that, that's what I'm, I'm perceiving, right? And mm -hmm. So it's a, a, an invitation for us to, to contribute, but also not to kill ourselves in the process, yeah. right? <laughs> which, uh, which, yeah. uh, uh, the thing is, once you've documented it once, and you use these standard fields, other people, when they're trying to use that data set or trying to train models, can look at what you've done and they don't have to do the same exercise. So we share the load. Mm -hmm. And this is the reason open source works. And we're just trying to do it in, the, in a way that we can do this with data as well as with trained models that's missing right now. Thank you for the insight. Okay. Any other questions or thoughts? Well, then... I will say thank you very much. Oops, anything else? No? Okay. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate your interest.